Intonation is simultaneously one of the most common topics in violin playing, but also one of the most misunderstood. I'm going to show you an awesome exercise buried deep in the books of Sevchik that's going to transform your intonation. It's like the way braces work on your teeth, but much faster. Hi, my name is Daniel Kurganov. Welcome back to my Violin Masterclass series. I hope you're all doing well and ready to talk about intonation. I want to dig deep into the basics of intonation and tell you where I think some misconceptions lie. Your intonation is made up of three fundamental components. First is the shape of the hand, and this is your frame, let's say. Then there is the conception of the intervals themselves, so the whole steps, half steps, and so on. And finally, we have the shifts. Now, we're not going to cover shifting in this video, but just in those first two, you pretty much have everything you need to know to play in tune. Now, what all three of these have in common is that they're oral techniques and not really physical ones. So you can imagine left-hand dexterity as being very physical. It takes many repetitions and drills to strengthen and sculpt the left hand to really get that clarity and articulation without the tension. Now, intonation is entirely different. It's more about how closely you're listening and how carefully you're measuring your intervals. There isn't any particular strength required for good intonation versus bad intonation. As I tell my students, nature doesn't discriminate. So nature doesn't care if it's a millimeter this way or a millimeter that way, which is the difference between in tune or out of tune. So it's not fundamentally a physical issue. It's an oral issue. So this presents us with a unique opportunity. If you can adjust the way that you listen to and discover these finite number of patterns, you can really transform your intonation in as little as one week. Now let's get to the Sevchik. So this is a double stop exercise from Sevchik's indispensable Opus 1. And Opus 1 has four books. We're going to look at books 1 and 2. And specifically, in book one, it's exercises 24, 25, 26, and in book two, it's 10, 19, and 28. So basically, it's various double stop patterns in one position, strung together with continuous even sound. It ranges from simple, to complex, slides, jumps, dexterity work, many keys and harmonic progressions, and even beautiful little moments. What I love is that the exercise forces you to constantly regulate and calibrate the frame of your hand and solidify intervals and the relationships between your fingers. So let's look at this first one. This is book one, number 24. One of my favorite things about this is that in the way he writes this, he's actually teaching you how to practice. Very often, it's as if what he writes is actually 
a little exercise that he himself invented to practice one or two double stops, or to make a particular weak finger stronger and more independent. And this is very typical of Sevchik. In fact, he has these entire guides to Mendelssohn Concerto, Brahms Concerto, and some other pieces, where he takes you bar by bar and shows you how to practice everything. Now, you probably know something about the best practices of intonation work. You know, we want to be checking our intervals, we want to compare with open strings, and we want to listen to those beat frequencies that tell us if intervals are really lined up in their overtones. Notice how when I practice this slowly, I don't necessarily pay attention to the rhythm. I'm trying to make pure and consistent sound, and I'm moving my fingers very slowly so that I can really be in control of the choreography, of how tight the half steps are, how wide the whole steps are. And then when I'm more confident, I'm going to articulate the fingers more. That's when, that's when all the repetition comes into play. So, Starting to drill everything right from the beginning with intonation doesn't really work because you have to really find what sounds perfectly in tune. And you can't do that like this, you know, trial and error. You have to do it very slowly. And then once you get it, okay, now let's uh, solidify it and then you articulate. Another thing you'll notice in this exercise is the consistency of sound. And again, that's built right into the exercise itself. Remember to always give yourself a clean, simple, and pure tone for any intonation work. This will allow you to stop less, to think less, and to really focus on feeling and listening. You can imagine tuning your violin if you kept stopping and thinking and go again, set in tune. Like, what am I actually thinking about there? Or people who... You know, use many bow changes. Of course, the way we want to tune is the very continuous and even sound. The same idea works with your bow arm in general. We spend a lot of time thinking about angles and coordinating movements in this part of the bow and that part of the bow. But the best long-term strategy is to integrate all of these ideas into one feeling so that it's one thing that you have to recall in order to execute a complex motion, as opposed to a combination of 100 factors. So that's also going to let us hear what our fingers are doing with much higher fidelity. So you see he's starting to modulate much more, and this means you need some stability in the frame of your hand. So we get that stability from one and four, from our octave frame. Otherwise, all of the changing keys and intervals are just gonna throw you off, and it's like you're gonna be searching for individual notes. Um, now, just in that last bar, we have this one, four octave, and that's really going to define the shape of your arm, right? So the considerations are, you know, how far is my arm tilted this way? How is my wrist? Is it out this way? No. Is it straight? Maybe. A little bit inwards? Maybe. I have uh, a short pinky, so for me I have to uh, supinate the hand much more, so that 1-4 feels really solid. You need to start visualizing and hearing clearly the whole in half steps. So I, I like to actively visualize this in my head. So I'm thinking of like, is it this? Is it this? 
Is it this? Is it this? And so in that example, we have whole step, whole step, half step. And no matter what strings your fingers are on, they might be going across all four strings, you should maintain the sort of vertical alignment that a half step between fingers is a half step between fingers, no matter whether it's uh, you know G and E string or D and A string. Next, you'll want to notice if the out of tune and difficult spots show some sort of pattern. And by that, I mean you need to determine tendencies. The most common is that half steps are not tight enough and whole steps are not wide enough. Um, but there are other tendencies, like maybe your first finger is sliding due to the activity of the other fingers. Or a very common one, your low second finger starts sliding up. Um, simple things like that seem like they're random or very specific to a certain passage, but very often it's like one or two tendencies that just pop up everywhere and of course make you sound generally out of tune. So you see in that passage, it's very important how we move vertically across the strings as well as place fingers horizontally. So by that I mean playing fifths, uh, using the tips of the fingers to not hit the neighboring strings, and of course all the jumps that we have to do, including you know flipping and reversing the fingers. All of this can cause a lot of tension. If you're not um, intently thinking of the vertical placement of the fingers, you're going to get that fifth by pressing harder, or you're going to kind of crawl your way when you should do a quick light jump. So keeping things very light and planning out that choreography is much, much better than, you know, tensing the hand or contorting it to achieve that. Otherwise, you'll hear all sorts of noises and heavier fingers will kind of drag across the strings more. So you won't quite make it to the right note and intonation will suffer. There's a jump right from the B to the F. Another jump. This is a crisscross of the fingers. So you see there are a number of jumps in a row. So you have to coordinate that. One way to practice these jumps is to put open strings in between them at first. <laughs> so it kind of takes the pressure off of you to you know, erase the noises in between. And it's just working on the lightness and quickness of the motion. Then from there you can take away the open strings and you'll find the coordination is improved. Now I'll show you a particularly challenging one, for me at least, and let's see what we can learn from it. So you see my hand is moving all over the place. but. I'm not tensing the hand up and I'm not trying to contort or stretch it. So here's my process for that. Already I know that this F with the fourth finger stretched is coming. So I start with my arm further under the instrument and I take this contact point off of the violin because you see I can stretch more easily, like really, really far. And if I have that contact point, that limits how far I can stretch. So I take that away and I get under the instrument and I lean the hand back a little bit. So that way I can reach that octave with very little difficulty. Additionally, with the first finger, I'm almost on the side of the finger instead of on the tip. So on, on this side. So my hand is laying down this way instead of being uh, perpendicular to the fingerboard. It's like fanned out. And what I get from that is this stretch is working for me as opposed to trying to stretch this way. It's much easier to do to do this, right? That's just the fingers up and down. 
Above all else, it's important to resist the urge to press down on the fingerboard with a lot of pressure. Um, it'll be your natural instinct to do so if things aren't easy or reachable. So what I like to do when I'm practicing this is I tell myself, okay, I'm going to decide on my maximum pressure and I'm not going to go beyond that. And whatever I need to do, I can adjust uh, my hand, my fingers, my arm, but I'm not going to press more than this amount. Now, in that exercise, which is number 25 in the first book, Sefcik takes a bit of a detour into more specific dexterity and finger independence work. Um, this is very challenging, especially with a held finger and all of these slight interval changes. Remember to take breaks, avoid any stiffness, and you can combine this with my scroll support method, where you can you know, basically rest the scroll and not feel like you need to hold the instrument up. So you can really be more free and finding that perfect position just takes one thing off the table, one less thing to worry about. One thing I really like to do is take a random page and start with that after I do some of my, you know, more basic dexterity and sound production warm-ups. I pretty much don't remember any of it from earlier practice sessions because it's kind of written in this hypnotic perpetual motion way where you're not supposed to memorize it. I find that it's a very good practice to sight read it, and this tests your agility, it tests um, how well you know these patterns, how quickly you can adjust, and that's really what the exercise is training. Now, there are a couple of ways that we can adjust this. So, first of all, I wouldn't do the printed bowings, at least not in the beginning. Do four, uh, two beats per bow, or even one beat per bow, this will allow you to play it really slowly, to listen and to feel things um, without any anxiety. One very important thing you should do is repeat each bar multiple times before going on. I'm not doing it now because we'd be here all day, but definitely repeating each bar and even repeating, you know, two beats. Just having that loop so each time you do it, it's a little bit calmer, it's a little bit more premeditated, you know, whatever the finger choreography is, more in tune, nicer sound. You know, the list of things you can improve with every repetition is endless. Another thing you can do is add vibrato. Now, some of these are gonna be much too difficult or much too awkward to add vibrato, but for some of them, you can definitely start vibrating the hand, you know, just very modestly. And that's a true test of whether the frame of your hand is relaxed and it's not contorted in any way and you're not overpressing. If we go back to the Bach that I played at the beginning of the video, maybe you can see the relevance of this exercise. Now, if I took the rhythm and the music and life and joy out of that piece of music, uh, I can get it to sound pretty close to one of these Sefcik exercises. So you can imagine going through a piece like that, inventing all these sorts of exercises, because you're gonna find all of the same things in that Bach. Uh, fingers jumping, fifths being held down and prepared in advance, um, one finger sliding, one finger staying, and obviously so many double stops.
This is very difficult because I have to pivot in such a way that it's not so extreme because then the intonation of the second finger will change. If you were really sadistic, you'd turn this into a shradic exercise. So that's all for today's video. I hope you enjoy playing these exercises and I hope I give you a bit of insight into how to work on them. While it might not look like a lot of fun to play these, it's a real joy once you start getting the hang of them. Just listening closely and being able to hear pure sound and pure intonation with all of these changing harmonies, it's so simple but it's really quite rewarding and it just enriches you, I think. So try this for a week or two and see what it does for your intonation. I think you'll see some interesting results. In any case, come back, write a question or a comment, and I'd be curious to know about your progress. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like the content. You can also head over to my Patreon where I'm making other videos and offering some perks. That's definitely the best way to support my work. And see you next time. Be well.